Hey there, I'm Pete Townsend, and this is Money Never Sleeps. We look inside the minds of entrepreneurs and at the crossover of startups, enterprise, finance, technology, and life as we know it. This episode of Money Never Sleeps is sponsored by Philip Lee, one of Ireland's fastest growing corporate law firms and expert advisors at the heart of the Dublin and London startup, fintech, and crypto communities. On the show this week, we've got... I'm Will Martin, founder and CEO of LiveDuel. And... I'm Laura Berkic, and I'm a product designer at LiveDuel. LiveDuel is a DeFi-powered digital sports market with live fan engagement. LiveDuel supports decentralized sports betting built on blockchain to give you a fairer deal than traditional sports betting sites. LiveDuel are the fifth of 10 founding teams from the Launchpool Web3 Techstars Accelerator class of 2022 that we've got on the show over the next couple of months. In this episode, I talked to Will and Laura about how they got together with Alex Luce to drive LiveDuel forward, what LiveDuel is and how it works, replacing the house in sports betting markets with DeFi liquidity pools, and staying close to the long-term vision while executing in the short term. All right here on Money Never Sleeps. Listen, just to get started, why don't we do this? We'll share your backstory, how you got to this point, and then we'll ask Laura to do the same thing, yeah? Sure, sounds good. So my own background is in economics and computer science. While I was in university, learned about arbitrage in the financial market. So back of economics class, learned about price difference in oil between, say, London and New York, and traders making a profit by executing two trades and noticing a price difference. And so my clever brain went, huh, I wonder if you could do that for sports betting, because there was a new thing called Betfair at the time. And Europe was kind of going through what America is going through right now in terms of a sports betting revolution with loads of betting uh, companies starting up. So made a lot of money doing that over a number of years, had kind of identified my career when I was quite young. I wanted to be a, a Wall Street type uh, trader on the floor, barking out ideas, throwing hand signals of what you're buying and selling. Um, so I did that for a couple of years was very different. It was all on a computer, four screens, very, very boring. But I was working the day of the flash crash in May 2010. A trillion lost in like 15 minutes. Thankfully, I was not in any trades at the time, but the market kind of bounced back very quick. And that was my kind of hands up in the air moment of I'm never going to be able to compete with bots, algorithms, high frequency traders. Because I was reading Fed reports, job reports, inflation numbers, loads of screens and charts, trying to get an advantage. But when you're competing against computers who've bought and sold tens of hundreds of millions worth of stock in a second, by the time you even turn on one of those four screens that I was using, and that's when I kind of went, that's actually not for me. So later on that year, my brother got married in India. And so I decided to take the the long route home, use that as the, the kind of starting point to a world tour. I went to Indonesia, Macau, because uh, obviously it was quite interesting in the, the sports betting world. And I'd heard that Macau is seven times larger than than Vegas. So I was like, okay, how is that possible? I've been to Vegas before and it's absolutely insane. Went to Taiwan and learned about NFC uh, technology. Then went back to the States and then home to Ireland. So I actually kind of came back with the idea of NFC being the future of money payment. So that was in the end of 2010. Had tried a startup there in that space. Essentially what I was kind of trying to do was digitize loyalty cards for coffee shops. So people would just tap with their phone instead of getting the little paper card that they stick in your wallet and you get a stamp. Very interesting product, way too early. And kind of realized that the Samsung Galaxy 2 was also launched in Europe with, with NFC. Then at the last minute, they went, actually, no, we're not going to do that in Europe because uh, the technology just wasn't here. You know, even recently, Apple had been brought up by the, the EU for locking down their NFC chip. So even if I had tried to struggle on, I would have been... Uh, very, very tough. So yeah, I worked in startups for a number of years. Went back and did a master's. When I was building the the NFC product, I was teaching myself Android co coding and it was taught through the University of San Francisco. So I was like, okay, I've kind of given up on, on this startup. Maybe I'll just go to San Francisco, absorb the culture, sit down on a few of these classes. But turns out it was just a, kind of a, a once-off. But when I was on the University of San Francisco website, came across this master's that was three sister universities. So studied in Barcelona, Taiwan, and San Francisco. So yeah, kind of used that as a jumping off point to get into deeper into education. So when I finished that, I did a startup weekend, which is part of the Techstars, and learned a lot about actual, okay, you have this idea, how do you actually execute? Whereas a master's in entrepreneurship and management, as good as it was, you're kind of reading Harvard Business Review papers. So it was very 
much on the, the high level kind of side. So when that ended, I did a gamification kind of program and that was through the University of uh, Pennsylvania and University of Stanford did machine learning kind of program because I kind of identified those two in, in 2012 as being hugely influential uh, for the next kind of 10 years. And I guess we're still kind of seeing that today that machine learning, AI and gamification are, you know, they're quite totally. opposite, but they do great things for, for technology and products. Very good. And then getting going with your Sports Tech Live podcast in 2019, doing the Techstars Sports Tech newsletter, those experiences leading up into the beginnings of LiveDuel. Now, you founded LiveDuel a, a number of years back, but it yeah. feels like it's just started in the last probably year or two, pivoting a bit and, and ramping up into Web3, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually bought the domain how while I was still in university in 2008. Um, okay. So I just Smart kind of, move. Yeah. Fell in love with the the idea of everything going, going live. It was kind of when I was doing sports betting arbitrage and sports betting trading, you know, everything was becoming about the live action. You know, before that, it was all about, you know, getting your bet in before the match started or the game started. But then, you know, there was kind of innovation in the industry of, I guess, kind of real-time delivery of prices and being able to execute trades. So, yeah, I just love the the idea of the live aspect. And then the dual kind of side was people love having their own opinions. And when you kind of mash those together, you know, people have not an adversarial kind of conversation, but, you know, the beauty about sports is always the, the great debate. People will have different opinions on even just seeing a game, whether someone played well or not, you know, people will have opposing opinions. So Live Duel kind of pivoted around uh, multiple different kind of ideas. Sports betting was actually where it kind of started, but obviously the, the regulatory stance in the world right now is very different to what it was in 2014. US have legalized, so, you know, that's a huge opportunity. When I was trying to Big raise in, in San Francisco in 2014, it was basically like, America will never legalize, you know, it's just one of those things that it's, it's just not going to happen. So yeah, I've been in the sports space for a long time, reached out to Techstars actually before they had a sports tech program saying, Hey, I'll do the sports tech newsletter for you. And they're like, no, it's not something we're interested in. And then, you know, now they have three sports tech programs in the last kind of three years or so, maybe four years. Uh, so Indianapolis, Melbourne and Minnesota or Minneapolis. So yeah, I've been doing that for three years and it's a great way for me to kind of stay on top of what's happening because the world of sports tech is so broad. You know, it's sports betting, it's streaming, it's AR, VR, metaverse, crypto, marketing, social media, data, hardware. Big time. It's, it's, it's everything. So it's a great way for me to kind of stay on top of all the trends and who's doing deals with who. Very good. We're going to come back to what is Live Duel in a minute, but, you know, just rounding out, looking at your backstory, Will, and seeing the financial background that I want to be a trader. I went through that same experience myself well as, as well back in the 80s and 90s. And then getting this multiple different set of experiences and education and immersive activities that you were involved with that all have combined into what you're doing right now just seems like the right story. Yeah. Laura, I want to hear from you as well yeah. over the last 10 years in the UX space, in product design. Why don't we bring you into the loop here as well in terms of how you got to this point, yeah? Yeah. Well, back when I started, I actually wanted to become an artist. But Okay. Yeah, which is quite different, but uh, very similar. And I'll tell you why. Artists needs to have skills, obviously, to paint and draw, but uh, the core of being an artist is being able to observe, analyze, and to create something new based on what you observed. And uh, this part of the creation and analyzing is very useful when you are doing a product, uh, which is for people to use, obviously, a digital product as well. So I didn't want to be a starving artist because I didn't like that lifestyle. And I understood that you could use all these skills in order to make something that it's needed on today's economy. And that's why design came in and I joined an IT company that was eight years ago. Before that, I also have my own, had my own little startup where it was the beginning where people started using smartphones like around 10 years ago. And I really like the, that interactive part of your product because you're building something that really people really use and uh, looking at how people use it and then, okay, I can do it better. 
and observing that and creating something that is uh, alive. It gives you so much pleasure and I don't know. That's a super interesting combination there, Laura, in that, yeah. you know, the, the origins of wanting to be an artist and that where you're creating things, the eye just or yeah. the ear just appreciates and putting that much thought into something so that you can have this flat medium or perhaps mm -hmm. sound medium, mm -hmm. um, but it sounds like in your case, it's flat medium that, you know, that, that someone can appreciate and enjoy, but then turning on the interactivity angle. Um, yeah, sure. Basically, it's the evolution of art, but it's, this is a commercial use. And I think uh, people are abandoning, not really going in the museum, consuming art also on, on the phones, their laptops, listening and all that different ways to interact that are present today and being able to create something that people really use it's it's the best thing you can do as an artist actually but i'm not an artist obviously i think you might still be an artist so we'll, we'll <laughs> you know don't tell yourself short but you know just looking at your background and seeing you move through 2012 2013 14 into 15 you know as a designer freelancer digital designer and then for about seven years with SofaScore, yeah. right? Tell us a little bit about that and how that's kind of unfolded for you in terms of how you ended up meeting Will. Yeah, sure. So at the time when I joined SofaScore, it had already 1.5 million active users. So it wasn't small, but when I left, it was about uh, 20 million active users, which wow. is actually a huge uh, number of users. And it's fun to look at all the comments that people have on your product and also doing user research with so many users. It's great planning the product for so many users and any change that you want to make and how people react to those changes, deciding what to implement first, also based on comments and also based on popularity of a certain sport or a feature, always comparing yourself uh, to competition. And uh, also when you do something, when you have a design that people start copying and then, you know, you did something, all, all that actually it was fun to be copied by someone else. Yep. And <laughs> I still see a lot of my ideas and uh, things that I changed in the way a uh, live score looks that other apps are using. And still, I, even though I'm not in the company anymore, I still look at my designs uh, there. Nice. Uh, yeah. Appreciate your own art. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I really uh, have fun uh, when I see other people looking at it mm, much more than, uh, you know, the way I consume it, because I always just have the eye that still analyzes what I did, but others aren't not so much analyzing, they're just enjoying it or using it as a tool for an everyday life, which is great. Very good. Very good. And then, Will, why don't you maybe kind of round this out here and bring us together with how you and Laura got together. Yeah, for sure. So last September, my friend from university, Fino, studied with him in Barcelona, lived with him in Barcelona, and then we traveled to Taiwan and San Francisco. He, he got married, so I was over in Barcelona for his wedding, and obviously it was during the pandemic and had been nowhere in about 18 months. So I was like, okay, we're going to use this as a holiday, you know, jumping off point of two days for the wedding, but let's stay in Barcelona for an extra week. And like I do when I go anywhere, I'm always looking up Meetup or Eventbrite just to see what's happening in that city that I'm in. Uh, turns out there was a, a sports betting conference. So I used my tech stars, sports tech live background nice. to say, Hey, I'm from the media, any chance of a free ticket? And they went, yeah, that's absolutely fine. But can you include a link in our, in the digest uh, to help promote it? So got free tickets, went along and there was a bunch of startups there and SofaScore was there. And I've, I've been a user of SofaScore for a number of years and just have been obsessed a bit about the design and how they, I guess, kind of take pretty generic sports data and turn them into pretty charts and data visualizations to help me as a sports fan kind of understand what's happening on the pitch. So I kind of spoke with someone from SofaScore, did kind of a profile on them for the newsletter, but I was kind of asking questions about, you know, who's the designer, you know, I, I use it as such a great product, speaking with Emma from SofaScore. So I reached out to her, connected her on LinkedIn, and then found Laura 
through Emma and then I was messaging with Laura on LinkedIn after we connected. She said, Hey, I'm actually meeting Emma tonight for a glass of wine after work. So we kind of made arrangements then to, to kind of meet up and explain the product in more detail and kind of showed the designs that I did. Cause during the first lockdown, I did a UI UX course. So I have very, very basic skills there, but I think it was enough to kind of convey the message of what I'm trying to build. That's the way to do it. You know, it's the power of the network, right? Yeah. Get out there okay. and well, go in with an educated mindset first on what it is that you're looking for. No, oh, it's great. And, and Laura, how, how did you feel about connecting with Will at first? Yeah, well, I really liked the idea because it was basically all that I knew already. Also, I was kind of new in the blockchain too, but it's a year now and you know how things in the blockchain world are very fast. In a year, you can really get to learn a lot. And the idea of merging those two things into one prediction market, I liked it from the very start. So basically the idea was so great that I said, okay, sure, uh, let's do that. Good. And then Alex, your CTO, tell us how you brought him into the mix as well. Yeah. So it's funny. We, we met John Hill at the start of the, the Techstars program at the former LinkedIn evangelist and yep. I guess LinkedIn extraordinaire of how to the power of the network and building relationships. So after I did start a weekend in San Francisco, after I did my master's, I kind of got involved, came back to Ireland and decided, hey, the Cork ecosystem isn't as well connected as it should be. And this was in 2013. So decided to run a startup weekend and it was kind of a very good, successful weekend. But after that, I kind of took the next step in the startup weekend ecosystem and that's becoming a facilitator. So I've facilitated events all throughout Europe, Canada, America, UK, etc. So in 2018 or 2017, I think it was, Techstars started doing a founder con in Europe, which was in Berlin, but they just acquired Startup Weekend as well. So they decided to do a facilitator con and John Hill presented in both rooms for the founders and for the facilitators. Uh, so he showed us skills of how to make use of our network. So that's how I found out Alex essentially. So I was looking at the market of prediction markets, found a, a successful competitor, check the box of when you're looking for someone, their ex company, check the box for, for that competitor, looked for react. So I was, okay, react is probably the technology we're going to reuse. And I think probably only like two people might have showed up. Alex is one of them. Wow. So I kind of reached out to him, set up a, a Zoom call, kind of explained the idea and where it was kind of coming from. And yeah, he loved it. So we decided wow. we'd gotten a grant uh, from BeatPro Network. So it kind of gave us initial funds so I could, you know, speak to Laura and speak to Alex and say, hey, we've made some little progress, but now we need your help to unlock the idea and uh, start putting things in motion from a product perspective. Hey everyone, this is Pete. Let me tell you about the folks at Philip Lee. A few years ago, I was at my first venture capital industry dinner in Dublin, and honestly, I felt a bit lost. I bumped into Andrew Tizali, one of the partners at Philip Lee. He bought me a pint and introduced me to the team, and they took me under their wing. That take you under their wing approach has been what I've heard consistently from fintech and crypto startups who I know have worked with Philip Lee in Dublin and London to help them wrap the right legal framework around their business, fundraising, and regulatory needs. And I can't recommend them enough. Get in touch with the team at philiplee.ie or on moneyneversleeps.ie slash philiplee to learn more. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And that, you know, we're, we're all sitting there in the Techstars cohort at the beginning of April and listening to John Hill tell the story about how to use LinkedIn to the fullest to find people, right? Yeah. And find customers, find talent. And you had already done that. Yeah. And I had to thank John afterwards because I didn't even realize I was doing that. And I just, you know, kind of sat through his session multiple years before. It just became a habit of what I've done and I'm doing similar right now on the, the marketing side. Uh, wow. Community manager type role. So yeah. Powerful stuff. Shout out John Hill. Very good. All right. Well, listen, tell us what is Live Duel, Will, and why is it unique? And why is this something that just makes so much sense for the three of you to be working on right now? Yeah, so Live Duel is a DeFi powered sports uh, prediction market and live fan engagement platform. So I guess to deep buzzword that. Please do. Yeah. <laughs> so prediction markets are, 
you know, sports betting companies, they could be stock markets. And so we're focused very much on the, the sports side of things. What I love about sports is everyone wants to know the outcome. Everyone thinks they might know the outcome or everyone will have an opinion on what's going to happen. So being able to gamify that kind of side of things and while also having a financial incentive for the, the winners or the, the person who has the, the most knowledge or can predict the future. Because when you look at markets, you know, financialization of them makes them more efficient over time, or at least that's the, the general concept behind a, a stock market. So yeah, as a huge sports fan and as a former trader, I kind of wanted to bring the two together and see what benefits having the two together could make. So when you look at the sports betting industry, you know, it's very much the house always wins type philosophy. And the reason they win is because they, they include a five to 20%, what is essentially a fee into their VIG. structure. Yeah. The VIG exactly. Yeah, if you're from America, I don't know what the, the European kind of version is, but by removing the house, you don't need to charge such high rates. So we believe that can deliver a better product uh, to the end user that they've a fairer outcome. So when I was watching March Madness, a flip of a coin on the, the spread, bet a dollar to win 80 cents. That's a very terrible result because it's yep. a coin toss. You should be hitting close to a dollar in return. Right. Um, so we believe with using the power of DeFi and the blockchain, bet a dollar, win 96 cents. Obviously there's still kind of fees involved, but that's a 20% uplift from traditional sports books. Got it. You got me thinking now, Will. You really got me thinking <laughs> now. Is there a way that this can go that says you can actually get better at predicting the outcomes of sports games? Yeah, absolutely. You know, We've seen the data explosion in sports. I guess U.S. sports have probably led the way with all the, the data that comes out of each individual U.S. sport. You know, like baseball is pretty much a game of stats, mm -hmm. hence Moneyball. They were able to sign players that were undervalued that delivered them a, a World Series. Every season in, say, soccer, there's new stats being created and being marketed, essentially. You know, Amazon have done a great job of so-called next-gen stats. They're doing it for the NFL, they're doing it for rugby, they're doing it for soccer, they're doing it for Formula One because each individual game is producing so much data. Each individual data point is something that can be tracked and measured and correlated and put into a model that in the future might help people predict better than the average for sports games. And we haven't even kind of gotten into the, the areas around the data that's coming off the individual athletes. And there's kind of a, a big debate right now of who owns the the data coming out from the athletes, so heart rate, rest, recovery, VO2 maxes, distance covered, all these kind of interesting data points that could potentially form part of a prediction model to, to help people predict sports. But what I love about prediction markets is it's the wisdom of the crowd. So we read that book when I was in first year economics and, you know, the, the theory is get a large enough pool of people to make a prediction. It will be better than any one person or any one expert in that group. Um, and that's what I really love about prediction markets and markets in general is that whatever the price is or whatever the trading figure is, is, that's everyone's best guess at that moment in time. doesn't mean it's right, but that's the combined wisdom of hundreds of thousands or hundreds of thousands of participants say. So yeah, very excited to, to see the coming together of prediction markets plus data. And, you know, when we did, when I did the machine learning thing, it was all about building those models of taking in data points to have an output. And I'd love to, to kind of get back there. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's fascinating. And I'm thinking, Laura, that there is a responsibility here as product designer, not even a responsibility, but a, a, a strong need to say, yeah. okay, Will and I are riffing right now on statistical models and this incredible complexity of the art of the possible or the stat of the possible, whatever you want to call it. And there's then the need to abstract all that complexity away and put something in the user's hands that is simple and easy for them to understand and consume. How do you balance this complexity with all that is possible with data and statistics and the wisdom of the crowd, like you're saying, Will, with the need to create a usable product that surprises and delights people? How do you do that? Yeah. So first of, of course, you need to understand all, all the data and what they mean and think about new ways to use the data and the creativity there is with people who are very knowledgeable to, to decide, okay, how can we use the data? And when you know how, and when you know what's the main goals with the data you gathered, 
you, you want to abstract everything that people don't need, all the input that they don't really need to know exactly, and to do that in a way that really people do understand. And for that, when you have your sketches, your ideas all, with all the data and, and the, the views and the graphs, you have to test that. <laughs> you just have to show it to as many people as you can. Ideally, 15, 5 is already enough to show uh, if it's working or not. But when 15 people really understand what you wanted to show, then that's perfect. So basically, the process of gathering lots of ideas and then to narrow it down to... And, and sometimes it, it will not work and you have to be, you, you have to be uh, ready to bin all the work you did if it doesn't work. If people don't understand it, if it's more, if it's more of an obstruction for a user experience, because sometimes you just don't need the extra graph. And yeah. Yeah. I, how, how many conversations do you need to do to get to 15 that get it? Uh, well, uh, 15 different people. Okay. No, I thought you meant you'd go out to like a thousand people and you no. try to get to 15 that would say, oh yeah, I get that. I really, no, that no, makes no, sense no, to no, me. No, 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 no. The, that's the, the user base you need. You don't I, need to show it to so many people. I got you. Uh, I got 15 you. 15 people will already show uh, almost 100 of problems of the, your uh, user experience or, yeah. Because uh, if you didn't do it, you wouldn't expect for some problems to come up so quickly and repeat themselves, but they do. When you start showing people, you get it in, in a much clearer way. And you would never tell that uh, five people would, would, would have the same issue, but they do. So that's something that you want to tackle as fast as possible. I gotcha. That makes sense. And Will, shifting gears a little bit, why don't you tell us about who's replacing the house? Right. When you think about the house that provides liquidity to be able to take different sides of the bet and like like we said, take the VIG as well. With Live Duel, what is the plan for replacing the house and replacing that liquidity? Yeah, no, it's a very interesting kind of problem. When you remove the house, you remove quite a lot. So when I first came up with the idea for Live Duel, it was, you know, I guess the, the kind of start of the GameStop mania and had that kind of shower thought of, oh, like Robinhood has done an amazing job of taking a complicated financial transaction and making it a very seamless process. So I was like, that would be a very interesting thing to do for the world of sports. So went down that rabbit hole of what if Robinhood built a prediction market for sports and esports. And that's where the idea came out of. So the crypto side came secondary to that because I was facing the issue of liquidity provision. So if it was a pure exchange, you need to find people on both sides of the market. So that obviously wasn't going to work because that's really, really hard to scale because you have to find a Boston Red Sox fan to match with every Yankees fan so they actually can trade against each other. Whereas I'm not, I'm not sure which team is the better team, but I'll... I'll I, I no comment on that this week. Yeah. No comment on that this week. <laughs> yeah, I might use a soccer example. So, so I'm but. No, no, you go go ahead and use the Red Sox and the Yankees if you want, but I'm just gonna <laughs> okay. not gonna talk about how the Red Sox are performing. We we, okay. we don't talk about the Red Sox. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this week uh, Spurs are doing really well. It looks like they're going to get Champions League. Fingers crossed. I haven't jinxed it, but there might be a hundred people that want to bet on Spurs getting the Champions League because they're you know two points ahead, but one game to go, and a relatively easy game at the end. Whereas ten people might only want to bet on Arsenal. You know they have a harder fixture. They're two points behind. There's only one game left. So in a traditional exchange you know 10 of those trades could get matched off off each other and then the, there's another 90 spurs bets that will kind of go unmatched traditionally obviously if it's against the house the house would take the the other side of those 90 bets but when you go for a peer-to-peer -peer exchange there's 90 bets that will go unmatched which is a terrible experience obviously so that was a key kind of part of live duel is like how do we solve that issue and then the more i kind of got into decentralized finance and the world of crypto it was like okay that's where the liquidity provision is going to come from. So part of the live deal strategy is to attract liquidity providers, people who will put in money, stake it, will create a liquidity pool, and then the end user is effectively trading against that liquidity pool. So we'll move that liquidity to the different markets where there's demand. So this weekend, it might be, okay, the Spurs versus Arsenal example. Then on Sunday evening, it might be the Red Sox versus the Yankees. And it it's basically like a, a virtuous cycle kind of moving around, picking up the VIG and delivering a return for the liquidity providers. Yeah. And as long as the yield that you're paying to the liquidity providers is at the right level where the economics of your platform works, where the fees that you're taking in, that you're generating enough fees in order to pay that yield, but still 
keep a, a profit going, then you've got a nice little mini economy going there, which is the nature of Web3. Yeah. So building an economy rather than building a company. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, I guess my economics background, I've been very focused on that kind of aspect from the very, very beginning, because essentially you're creating your own closed economy. Obviously, there's kind of externalities and external factors at play, but, you know, essentially you're, you're trying to keep people in your economy and, and grow it over time. Very good. Thinking about how big this can all get, right? And that when, you know, that decentralized element, liquidity pools replacing the house and that um, expecting Live Duel to be incredibly successful with that, Will and Laura, and Alex in in absentia as well. (laughs) That And shout out to Alex. He is at Permissionless in Palm Beach, as I understand. I just saw a picture of him with a couple of other folks from the Techstars cohort. So shout out to Lucas Brule and Victor Lee, who are there in Palm Beach with him. So just to use the example from baseball, as we talked about this, this whole money ball angle, that there is a stat in baseball called wins above replacement or WAR war. And what that basically is, is that how many wins does a particular player contribute? What are their statistics in aggregate responsible for in terms of the number of games that their team wins based upon their performance in the game? And that it's a very, very complicated statistic, but it's used a lot. Best players sometimes are responsible for 10 wins per year. Okay. And if a major league baseball team has 81 games per year in their home stadium, another 81 games away, this is not including the playoffs, then you can say that Okay, if they're responsible for 10 wins per year, just do that half and half and say you're responsible for five wins in the home stadium out of 81 games per year, that one single player, okay? And so what's the revenue that that team makes for tickets for those 81 games that they play? And the better teams win more, the more bums on seats, the more tickets sold. So you can back into, what should I pay somebody, right? You can say that based upon the average number of wins they're going to create, a win will put X number of people in seats and create that much in ticket sales and advertising revenue and TV deal and licensing deals, all that type of stuff. You can actually go to that length to do this. And I think that's, you know, a lot of that type of math is used in how baseball executives come up with salaries that they're going to pay to their players. You could go to the nth degree with the statistics that you're going to gather here and what you make available for people to be able to predict, and then also folks on the other side to be able to provide liquidity for. Have you put much thought into how this looks and, you know, when the liquidity pools do take over for the house and what this element of decentralization can do to unlock a lot more value in this space? Yeah, you know, it's a really, really interesting point because data is exploding. Every data point is a potential market for us. But I guess to a point earlier, you know, we need to be kind of laser focused and make it as easy as possible for people to come on board. So we're going to be launching with three different markets for a typical sports or esports game. You know, who's going to win? Will it be over and under a certain home run number or in soccer, a certain goal number? And then the spread. So the favorite minus half a point or half a goal, the underdog plus or or minus the, the, the opposite amount. So the reason that we're doing that is that we want to focus our liquidity into the the primary markets and 80% of what's uh, bet on at the moment comes from those three markets because the key thing about those markets is that they go live and in play and will be active from two weeks before the game starts uh, right up to the final whistle. So that kind of that live element is where the lion's share of liquidity kind of comes into the market. So we're going to focus on those initially, but then, yeah, as you say, like there's, there's so much data, there's so much potential markets and I guess fantasy sports have taken a lead here of taking data and turning it in via gamification into a game and a competition and bragging rights um, for friends against friends or friends against other groups. So yeah, over time, we'll kind of look more at the, the esoteric kind of ones of okay. specific players, you know, you know, PRA is a big one in basketball, points, rebounds, and assists, you know, and over and under on that, I think would be phenomenal. But for, for us, for right now, we need to focus for the users into the, the primary market, but we also need to focus our liquidity uh, so we're not having loads of different little silos and splintering off into a market that might only generate, you know, 1% of, of the action. But over right. time, as we grow on scale, that becomes totally possible. This is the typically humbling conversation I have with founders. 
a lot of the time, which is Pete, listen, awesome idea, but you know what? We got to focus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is so true. That's why it's like, okay, stick this one in number 37 on the backlog. Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> and yeah it, you, it's all there. I've, it's all there. I've gone through it numerous times in my mind and yeah, there's huge potential there, but yeah, as a starting point, three markets. Keep very going. good. Very good. No, I get that. The, so yeah, three markets, getting the liquidity going. Laura, from a, a product perspective and the user perspective, what is the biggest objective for 2022 and, and hence possibly the biggest challenge right now to get that done? Get the initial 1,000 users. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. That's, uh, that's the story because it grows uh, exponentially from there. Because if uh, 1,000 people really love your product, then uh, you are uh, you know that you're able to scale it. So true. So true. I mean, Laura, you're so right. It's about getting people who absolutely love your product want to use it all the time and want to tell yes. a lot of people about it, yeah. you know? Yeah, because th that was also how I saw that Sophos Core grew at the beginning. Because when you are starting out, you don't want to use so much money for marketing purposes because you're still focused on building the product. If you're doing a big marketing before having a product that's good enough, then, then I think it's going to fail. But that's just my opinion. Maybe people just use marketing as much as they can. But if it grows in, in a natural way where people are recommending your product and they, their friends are also using it, it's uh, a more stable structure to build forward rather than having huge marketing, a lot of new users, but also they might not stay and not use it. And if you have one person who came in quite early with your product, you have also a loyal a loyal friend who will use your product. And you also when you have a contact with the users and you're reaching out to hear their perspective and you implement, you, you make the product better based on their opinions, they feel the product is right for them. They feel a better connection with the whole brand and the product. So. Also a way of decentralizing is not only decentralizing finance in the product, it's decentralizing the way the product, product gets built. Obviously, as we are overlooking the product, deciding uh, some things, but also giving it to other people to decide which is the next big feature that we're going to implement, which is the next uh, market or sport that we want to have in the app and when most of the users want uh i don't know baseball <laughs> we will do that yeah yep no that feels very much like a dao so live dao yeah. instead of live duel yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, i do own live duel dot dao so yeah that's good yeah. <laughs> good yeah. that's awesome no listen I, it's you know one of the things that that i always think about when i'm when i'm doing these conversations is that you know they they we're at a certain point in time with any of the founders that we talk to on this podcast and that there is so much energy and enthusiasm and optimism and expectation here as to where we all go next. And, you know, given, given the chat we had today, I'm even more fueled with that. So with that, I'd like to move to the last question that we ask everybody on this podcast, which is what is one thing that we wouldn't expect to know about you? And Will, we could start with you. Yeah. I think Hugh thought I was going to be shorter. He's like, God, you look a lot taller in real life than you do in Zoom. So that's maybe a huge specific <laughs> one. People on the program as well, when I kind of said that I'm more of an introvert, people are like, no way, I'd never have guessed that. So that's, that's maybe another one. Because I'm quite social, but definitely love the, the, the more introverted kind of lifestyle. But yeah, I guess the fun fact about me is that I collect flags. Yeah, every country I go to, I pick up, whether it's a small, you know, tiny little one or a full size one. Um, not sure where it kind of came from, but just love the idea of flags and it resonating. So the stars and stripes, you know, what does that yep. evoke in you? And every time for the July, you know, everyone's got their, their stars and stripes and it's the same for every country. You know, there's such passion and emotion that can be put into a rectangle of three different colors, you know, totally like mm -hmm. wars are fought over it. And I just find it fascinating. So yeah, regional flags, national flags. Yeah. I think they're That's all amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. We, we were, my wife and I, when we were traveling, we would buy a fridge magnet in every single country. And then when we, when we got our kitchen redone, the front panel of our fridge is wood. <laughs> so no more fridge magnets. So make sure make sure you have a good place to put all your flags. Well, yeah. Oh yeah, I didn't factor in where how I was going to store them or where I was going to put them. So they're all just kind of like folded and stuff in the back. 
Awesome. Like drawer. <laughs> That's great. Laura, what about you? What's one thing people wouldn't expect to know about you? That my uh, big wish is to be part of a rock band. <laughs> Ooh, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Since I was a kid, but it never happened. And I don't know if it happens when I'm 80, I'm still happy. All right. Well, we're going to get you pretty close because demo day for the Launchpool Web3 Techstars Accelerator is going to be at the Button Factory in Dublin which is a great venue where I've seen many a gig. So we're getting you pretty close to that, but we'll see if we can get my kids down with their guitars because they're, they're much better at it than me. Are you more of a singer or are you um, a instrument player? Yeah, I play the guitar, but not well enough. Okay. <laughs> all right. We can all work on it together. So, <laughs> But listen, folks, absolutely loved talking to the two of you today in depth about Live Duel. And I learned something in every conversation. So thank you. It's awesome to have you both on the show. And I know that I'll be talking to you later today. Cheers. Thanks, Melanie, for having us, Pete. Thank you. That does it for this week, folks. Thanks to Will and Laura for opening up their minds to help us figure out why they do what they do. Links to get in touch with Will and Laura and learn more about Live Duel are in the show notes on our website, moneyneversleeps.ie. So check us out online. Also, thanks to Conan Brophy from Create Sound for mixing and editing this episode. Conan is an excellent media man to get in touch with when you're thinking about launching your own podcast. As for me, I'm an early stage startup investor and advisor focused on where fintech meets crypto and crypto meets Web3. If you'd like to talk to me about your business, drop me a line on info at moneyneversleeps.ie. Finally, till next time, thanks for listening. See ya!